family. Wasn't that family good? I love to see families come and sing. Yes, sir. Amen. If you have your Bible this morning, turn to the book of Hebrews, chapter number 10 and verse number 5. Hebrews chapter 10 <clears throat> and verse number 5. The scripture says, Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. Father, bless this holy book now. In thy name I pray, amen. You can be seated. There are some themes that run through the book of Hebrews that uh, are emphasized as uh, no other book in the Bible. And the book of Hebrews talks about the body of the Lord Jesus Christ and says that a body had been prepared for him. Now that's quite a statement. In Hebrews chapter number 10 and verse 10 it says, By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Then in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 12, But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Yes, yes. Amen. Yes. And so the writer of Hebrews makes no bones about the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ's body was necessary for a sacrifice, and that sacrifice was absolute and eternal and efficacious. It cannot be mastered. It cannot be improved. It cannot be moved upon. It is finished once and for all and forever. Yes. So we find in the book of Hebrews, it says in chapter number 10 and verse number 14, it makes this statement, For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Yes. So the book of Hebrews presents a word for us, perfected. Now we live in an age when words are, as always, they, they're watered down in their meaning and people grab them and they say they use them as someone else used them. And I would advise you to get an unabridged dictionary and do the etymology on a word. In other words, trace where it came from and you'll find out what the word originally meant. Stick with that. Don't stick with the common usage of it because people always water it down and make it apply in ways it doesn't play. There is nothing perfect in this world but the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing. Perfection is an impossibility. It does not come. But there is a perfection that God does in you, and this is something he started in you, and he that hath begun in you a good work yeah. will perform it till the day of Jesus yeah. Christ. God has a reason. He has a goal. When the word perfect is a translation of the Greek word telos. And that word means to be completed, to be finished, but it means to be finished and completed with a goal in mind. So there's more foot to it than just simply finishing it. For example, a man builds a house in a subdivision. The house is finished, but the subdivision's not. He has a greater goal in what he's doing. And this is what we're talking about here. God saved you. And, but my friend, he saved you for a purpose and he started something in you that will not be finished till the work of God is finished. So the book of Hebrews emphasizes perfection. For example, chapter number two and verse 10, for it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Well, there's only one captain of our salvation. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. But it says here to make him perfect through sufferings. Now, I hope there's no one in the house this morning that believes he was imperfect. What it has in mind here is a completed goal, a purpose in why he came into this world. And notice carefully, the captain of your salvation was perfected through sufferings. The only way you'll ever be perfected in God and really begin to understand him is when you start suffering. When the flesh begins to hurt and your soul is being poured out like water and there are many things you can't answer, then you may begin to get a hold of the essence of God in your soul and it is then you begin to understand him. Yeah. Hebrews 5, 9 said, And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey him. Notice carefully, perfection is associated with his authorship. It's like a man who writes a book or an essay or so forth, but salvation was written out in the mind of God before it ever came into being. Yeah. 
You're a way of salvation, the purpose of salvation, the life you live in salvation, what keeps you saved, the one that saved you, how you're saved. All of this is by the author of salvation. But the Bible said in Hebrews 7, 19, For the law made nothing perfect, but the beginning, bringing in of a better hope did. And my friend, over and over and over again, the scripture makes it very clear. The law never could, never will perfect anyone. The law can only show you what you need. And what you need, my dear friend, are more, not more bars around you and not to be encased and enclosed and have more laws given unto you because all it can do is close you up and lock you up. But my dear friend, the only thing that will ever help you or anyone else is the changing of your nature. Once the nature changes, there is no need for a law. Amen. So the Bible said in Hebrews 9, 9, which was a figure for the time then present, which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. The blood of bulls and goats could never make one perfect. Why? Because the bull or the goat was carried by against its will. It was not a willing sacrifice. Not only not a willing sacrifice, it did not understand why the sacrifice was being made. The Lord Jesus Christ offered himself up willingly for us, and he knew why he was dying. He knew why that blood was being shed. And so in that was sense that we understand how your conscience can be cleansed and purged. Hebrews 9, 11, but Christ being come in the high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that it's to say, not of this building. The tabernacle is the abode of God, but it's also, the, it's also given so man can approach unto God. Wouldn't you like to know how to approach God? Singing is good. Praying is good. Preaching is all good. It all has its place. But that will never take the place of your own personal desire to approach God. Amen. Amen. Nothing can take that place. You have to do that on your own. The Bible said in Hebrews 10, 1, the law having a shadow of good things to come, not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continue to make the comers thereunto perfect. So all the Old Testament saints were imperfect because they did not have a perfect sacrifice. The Bible said in Hebrews 10, 14, for by one offering, he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. One offering, one time. And my friend, anything that you try to put with that or in place of that is an abomination to God. There are some sins that will cause you problems, but they're not all abominations. But when you try to replace the finished work of Christ, there is no greater sin than that. For he paid for sin in every sense of the word. So the Bible said in Hebrews 12, verse 23, To the general assembly in the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. The spirits of just men. In other words, the essence of just men. You're a spirit being that has a soul living in a body. One day you're going to give up your body and it'll go back to where it came from. And your spirit will return to God. Yeah. If you're saved, we pray that your soul will return to God. Yeah. And if you're not saved, your soul will go off into oblivion. Everything God did on this earth was dependent, therefore, on the virgin birth. The body of Christ was a product of a virgin birth. This is why we make such a big deal about it. This is why Christmas is such a big deal in the churches because it's about the maid, Mary, the virgin daughter of Zion, bringing forth into this world a child that was not of man but of the Holy Ghost, the virgin birth of Christ. So therefore, he says in Psalm 40, verse 7, Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me, then it is quoted in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 7. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. You know what you just read? Yes. You read the Lord Jesus Christ talking to God the Father. That's yes. what's yes. in the Bible. It's the yes. Son of God talking to God the Father. Isn't that something? Yes. And notice he says, I come to do thy will. Now, when he said that, when do you, when do you suppose that the Lord Jesus Christ 
said to God the Father, I come to do thy will because it's written in the volume of the book. Well, what book do you suppose he's talking about? Sears and Roebuck catalog? <laughs> Library of Congress? He's talking about the inspired word of God. He gave credence every time he spoke to the word of God. He never one time caused anyone to ever doubt the word of God. He said the scriptures are sealed and cannot be broken. The word of the living God. Notice carefully. The speaking of the son to the father was when he was 12 years old and he confounded the doctors of the law. The students of Hillel or, or, uh, or some other teacher of, the, of, of the, some Jewish sage, was it then? Or was it at the baptism of Christ when the Spirit of God came down in the form of a Holy Spirit, the dove that lit upon him? Was it there that he said to the Father, I come to do thy will? Was it at the wilderness after 40 days of temptation when Satan came to him in the weakness of his flesh? and tried to tempt him away from God? Was it then that he said, I come to do thy will? Or was it at Gethsemane when he prayed as it were great drops of blood? Was it there that he said, I come to do thy will? He said, not my will, but thine be done. Or was it at the cross? It's at the cross, at the cross at Calvary, when he cried out and said, Father, forgive them, for they know what they do. They're ignorant. They don't know what they're doing. They don't understand the purpose of God. When Peter said, Ah, not so, Lord. When the Lord Jesus said, I must be offered on a sacrifice for your sins. I must be given to the hands of men. Peter said, Let it not be so. Peter understood a very shallow understanding of the purpose of God in this world. He was born to die. He is the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. There is no other salvation outside of him. That's why he prepared for him a body, a prepared body, a prepared body. Don't you think about this for a minute. There's four different ways that you can get a body. Four. What do you mean, preacher? Here's four. You can either have it made by the hand of God. God made Adam's body, did he not? Got a body. How about Eve? Her body was made from a man, but without a woman. But she had a body. Yeah. Then there's a third way you can have a body, and that is as Cain and Abel, they were born of the union of a man and a woman. Like everybody in the house today, if you think you came some other way, you need to be look at yourself real good. <laughs> you were born. We were all born. But there's a fourth way that you can get a body, and that is there with a woman, but no man. In other words, a woman can bring forth a child, but there's no man. What are you talking about? Virgin birth. Yeah. When Mary brought forth the Lord Jesus Christ, a woman brought forth a man child, but there is no human father on this earth. God the Father brought him into this world. So the Bible gives us three reasons in the book of Hebrews, three different reasons in the book of Hebrews, that we should begin to look at God in a special way. Number one, to reveal God. His body came into this world to reveal the Father. Remember, God Almighty is an eternal, absolute, spirit, invisible being. If, you, if, you, if, if, if God did not reveal himself, and let me understand what a revel revelation is. When they go into a science laboratory, they put a microscope, they run all these different tests, and they find something. Like they discovered DNA back in the 50s. They found something. But revelation cannot be found. You can seek and search and put it under microscopes and hunt this and hunt that and you will never find God. He's got to reveal himself to you. When the Lord Jesus Christ came to this world in his body, he revealed God to man. That was the first time that God Almighty was revealed, this spirit being unto man. And spirit being he is, he revealed him. So the Lord Jesus Christ is God Almighty walking in flesh. Amen. He was here. The Bible says in verse number 5 of Hebrews chapter 10 once again, Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering, thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. A body. He said in John chapter number 6, I am the bread that came down from heaven. Moses gave you bread in the wilderness. He gave you manna. You eat that manna, but you're going to die. You're going to get hungry again. But if you eat the bread that came down from heaven, you'll never get hungry again. Those of you that understand what I'm talking about, when you come to God and you receive the Lord Jesus Christ, you never look for anything to take his place. There's nothing greater in this world. 
All the rest of these gods are nothing but vanity. The Lord, Je the, the Apostle Paul said, they worship when they sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons. It's nothing but a spirit world out there that is dead and separated from God. But if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, you have met the Father. He that hath seen the Son hath seen the Father. Have you been with me so long and you don't understand? I am the Father, our one. Amen. 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 If you want to know something about God, not everything, not everything, but something about God, then you meet his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll never know everything about God until God reveals everything that he wants us to know about him, and we have to be ready to receive that revelation. That's why the Bible said the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. They're foolishness to him, neither can he know them. You have no capacity to receive them. Say, who's the natural man, preacher? You're a physical. You're literal. It's so all you can touch and see and smell and hear and all that. You live by your, by your senses, by your intellect, by your mind, by your education. That's how you live. But you'll never find God. He's got to reveal himself to you. Well, how does he do that? He opens your heart. He breaks something. Yes, he does. He prepares you. And when he comes to you, you'll know it. Nothing in the world like that bumper sticker. I still laugh every time I see it. It says, I am God. Bumper sticker says, I am God. I think to myself, listen, house, if you were God, you wouldn't have to tell anybody you're God. If God Almighty walked down the middle of this church this morning, we wouldn't be sitting here praising and saying, we'd be on our face. Amen. The power of God, the glory of God, his presence would do it all. Amen. Amen. I'm God. Oh, my goodness. You're crazy is what you are. As they say over in Germany, doom cough. <laughs> yeah. That's what happens, though, with this Jesus movement that started when they were being baptized the Pacific out there in California and all that. And it started and morphed into a New Age movement, and that's where it is today. It's morphed again, and it's essentially the doctrine preached for most of the churches in America it's nothing in the world more than reworked New Age. And New Age is nothing in the world more than westernized Hinduism. Amen. Don't want to make anybody mad, but I told you the truth. That's where it is today. Second reason that he gave him a body was to defeat Satan. Defeat Satan. Now think about it for a minute. Well, why is Satan here to begin with? A good question. God's got a reason for Satan. He's got a purpose for him. Remember, till us. Remember that everything God does, he does it in eternity. Every decision he makes is not based on some temporal thing. He sees the end in the beginning. Yeah. Think about that for a moment. When you were put here, showed up, whenever you showed up, you showed up for a reason. God's got a reason for it and he's got a reason for you. And if you'll come to him, you'll find out there is a reason for life. Just a week or, week or so back, I get the message that some young 20, 30-year-old commits suicide. We live, in a, we live in a culture, my dear friend, that you, it's, it's nothing but materialism. How many of you after Christmas have a big letdown? You don't have to be. You don't have to raise your hand. But you get a letdown. And you look around and you say to yourself, well, my goodness, is this all it's about? Christmas can be a beautiful thing. Be beautiful. It can be precious and sweet, gentle, with your family, understanding the birth of Christ, the incarnation, all these wonderful truths. But for some people, <laughs> everything they can get. <laughs> Amen. Well, when you've got everything you can get, you're going to be miserable because stuff will never satisfy your soul. Amen. So they have the big letdown. Well, if <laughs> that's enough, I don't go to way too much. And I love Christmas. I do. But some of you approach it the wrong way. You expect something from Christmas that Christmas in itself cannot give you, but God can give you. But if you receive his truth and receive his word and receive the message of it, you're receiving truth, you're receiving life, you're receiving light. And therefore, you can live through it and be blessed of it. God bless you, and I, I pray you do. To defeat Satan was the second reason God gave him a body. 
Why is that? Here's why. God gave him a body to destroy him that had the power of death. Death. Thanatos in Greek. Thanatos. Death. What does that mean, preacher? Well, there's all kinds of deaths in the Bible. There's a second death. There's spiritual death. There's death of the body. So what did he come? He came to destroy him that had the power of death. So what did he do? What did he, do? he took his power. He died. He went, to the, he went down to the dregs of death. As we read over here in the book of uh, Job, Jonah rather, here's what he said in Jonah chapter number 2 and verse 6. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought my life from corruption, O Lord my God. And the Lord Jesus said himself, Jonah is a type of Christ. For as he was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so must the Son of Man. What do you mean? He was locked. He was not only dead, he was locked into death. And my friend, when Satan locked the gate on him, he said, I got him now, he's dead. <laughs> what happened? On the third day, life came into that. Life. Life. And when life came into that dead place, this living one took the keys of death. He swung the gate wide open. He walked out of there, the living one. And when he said to John in Revelation, he said, I am he that liveth. And they said, I was dead. He said, but behold, John, I'm alive forevermore. And he said, I have the keys. Death and hell. I got them. So the next time Satan tries to wear you out with death, fill your soul with fear of death. And fear of death is natural. The Old Testament saints for fear of death. It's natural. That's not saying you're some weak thing or you don't believe in God or trust the Lord. Not at all. The fear of death is natural. But next time Satan comes along and makes you sweat over death and tries to run you through with the idea of death, Take the keys and shake him in his face. He's got the keys. I know where I'm going, devil. You see, when he died, he died for me. When he rose, he rose for me. He lives, he lives for me. And Satan can't do a thing about it. Why? Listen. The strength of death is sin. If you break, drink, if you break the power of death, you break the power of sin. Amen. 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 When you break the power of death, you've broken the power of sin. You see, sin works from death to death to death to death. Truth works from faith to faith to faith to faith. From faith in God to more faith in God to more faith in God. But once you begin, once you start going down that long spiraling slide downward, this dies, that dies, this dies, that dies, this dies, this dies. The Bible says when sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth what? Sin and death, my friend, cannot be separated. They're inseparable. They're bound up together. You defeat death, you've defeated sin. So what do I do then? For to me to live is what? And to die is gain. And here's the third reason that God gave him a body. Hebrews 5.8 says this. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience... By the things which he suffered. Yeah, he did. He suffered. He learned obedience. What do you mean? He was disobedient? No, no, no. That doesn't mean he was disobedient. It means that he learned what it meant to come out of tragedy, to come through sorrow, to come through suffering. He learned what it meant to come through that. You see, God learned through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, as the God-man, how you live, how you breathe, how you walk, what moves you, what, fear, what fears you have that build inside you. Why you feel, he, listen, he felt pain like you feel pain. He felt it. He felt it. How do you, have you seen anybody crucified lately? That's one of the most horrendous deaths that a wicked mind has ever thought of to be crucified and it wasn't a Roman invention I, essentially they say they perfected it but they didn't invent it it was around before them and it's, and it's when they get it when they went into Japan a couple of hundred years ago Japan was a closed off closed off to the world they finally got in there here they find these people being crucified in Japan crucified 
crucifixion, crucifixion. That's a wicked thing. You tell me there's no pain in that? Have you hurt? Do you hurt? Do you have pain? Well, then here's what that means. That means I've been down that road before, the Lord says. And he says, I know what it's doing to you. I know what it's trying to do between you and God. I know how it's trying to separate you from the Lord. But I know exactly what it's going to take to minister to you. Because I will send the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit will come to you and he will minister to you based on what I have already endured in this world. That's what Romans 8 is about. And that's what his high priesthood is about. So he suffered pain. He suffered rejection. I was born in rejection. I know all about it. That's why I love kids, especially little kids that are, that are orphaned or they're, 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 they're up, uh, you know, uh, nobody wants them and all that. I have a special love for them. They touch my heart. This is why I support, I support St. Jude's Hospital for Children. Amen. Cancer. Support it. I think it's a good thing. Those little kids come on there and they're dying. And, uh, and uh, they, they said when St. Jude started, only one in five kids survived. Now, only one in five die. So they've made quite a progress, don't you think? Support the kids. I see little hungry kids. I want to help them. Little children. Children's Hospital here in Knoxville, Tennessee. That's a good hospital. I support that. I support that. Mayfield up here where the tornado came through and tore up all of that. And people lost their homes and they lost their livelihood and they lost their loved ones. And, and, and literally they're living in a living hell. And yet in the midst of that, I get an email from somebody up there and said, my house was not touched and I have a ministry here. Pray for me and pray that God will use me that I can reach the people. And I thought to myself, man, what a thing. What a thing. This is, this is where you, you have rejection. This is why I'm very sensitive to it to this day. Rejection. Rejection is one of the worst things in the world, folks. And then abandonment. They abandoned him. They left him. He said, will you also go away? And the apostle Peter is always, when he speaks, he speaks uh, extemporaneously. In other words, he just doesn't think a lot about it. He just says it. Amen. To whom shall we go? Where are we going? Where are we going to go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen, Peter. I agree with every word you said. Amen. Amen. And then the poor and the no home. The poor people. We live in, a, we live in an affluent world, a affluent country. We, we throw away more in this country than, than, than a lot of people ever have in their lifetime. We throw food away. Now, you ought to see some of these places where they have piles of garbage, and then there's the little kids that go into the piles of garbage to get their food. Yeah. They, they scavenge whatever they can find. Isn't that sad? Isn't that sad? That's sad. God's been good to America. But there are people out there, folks, that are doing the best they can to pay their bills. And a big argument in the country. Well, what should the minimum wage be? Well, how much money do you have to have to live? Where do you need to pay your bills, feed your family, take care of your kids? We got corporations in this country where we got multi, multi billionaires and they still don't have enough. We've got corporations in this country that the only thing, only thing that matters to them is a dollar bill. Dollar bill. Dollar bill. A country as affluent as this country, nobody should be hungry. Especially children. Especially little kids. Shouldn't be hungry. But he was, and he didn't have a home. He didn't have a place to lay his head. Foxes have holes, he said. Son of man hath no place to lay his head. So he knows how it feels. A lot of those people out there working two jobs. I knew of one case where one worked three jobs. Yeah. Try to pay their bills. There's a lot of cases out here in this country because of the, because of the, of the, of the, of the destruction of our culture where we've got mothers raising their children and they got some sorry low-down garbage for a husband that they haven't seen in 10 years. And they're paying the bills, and sometimes they have to work two jobs or three jobs. And it wears them down after a while. If you're a man, you're a man because you come and take care of your family. I don't want to hear it. If you, if you don't have enough, enough of the grace of God about you to work a job and feed your babies that you brought into this world, you're no man. You know what a man is. You don't, know, you don't have a clue what a man is. That's a man. He'll get up and he'll work when he's tired. He'll not force his wife to do what he should be doing. 
but he knows what it is to be poor. And for those people listening to me right now, and you don't have two dimes to rub together, let's pray that God will give you plenty of money to rub together. He can. He said, I can open the portals of heaven and pour you out a blessing. God will make a way where there is no way. He'll take care of you. He'll take care of you. Cast, cast your light, your life into his hands. He'll take care of you. Isaiah 53 verse 3 says, He is despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. We hid, as it were, our faces from him, and he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. I read something this morning I shouldn't have read before I get up to preach. There was a house fire in southeastern Pennsylvania. It was caused by Christmas lights. Everybody's got them. The husband and two of his sons were burned to death. They died in that house fire. The mother and the oldest son she was able to save. They got out. But what a horrible thing. Your best life now is not going to do them any good. I hope you know what I'm referring to. A book that was published. And that kind of garbage is out there everywhere. So what will help them, preacher? God, he's the only one. They've got, to, they've got to find their strength, their peace, their future, their hope in God. They've got to. That's the only one. People, friends can go to their side, and they should. They should help bear their burdens, and they should. They should be there. Every, everybody that possibly can be touched with that kind of sorrow and hurt, they should be there. But let me tell you something, folks. Nobody can minister to you that have lost a husband or a wife like somebody that has lost a husband or a wife. Nobody. Nobody. Nobody can minister to you except one like that. Why? Because your souls connect. That's why. Your soul connects. Family lose a child. Lose a child. Somebody says, I'm praying for you. Good, you pray for them. But the only person that can really help them is somebody who has lost a child themselves. Yes. Soul connects. Yes. Heard a soul mate? Yes. Yes. Soul connects. They understand how I feel. So when they pray, it's not a put on. No. They understand what's going on inside yes. me. So yes. when they come before God, they know how I feel. So they can offer up a prayer on my behalf. Are you following me? Yes. All kinds of stuff that happens to us. Be here all night if I try to. Try to, but I'm going to finish with this. Hebrews 2, 18. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor, 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 I prefer to call it succor, them that are tempted. That's translated from the Greek word ba-e-the-o. Ba-e-the-o. What does that word mean? Now here's what it means. Good to look up these words. Succour. Able to succour them that are tempted. Here's what it means. It is the swift to the battle cry, bearing aid in battle. How many of you men have ever been in combat? Okay. You've heard stuff on the battlefield you never heard anywhere else. And most men that have been in battle don't want to, don't want to remember it. I don't know how many people have told me, my dad was in World War II, but you can't get him to talk about it. That's all right. I understand that. Why? Because the battlefield's pure hell. That's why. You can't glamorize it. You can't do anything but look at it and think, my goodness, how could we do that to each other? But the battle cry is if one of your, if one of your members, one of your, one of your company or your squad or whatever has been overrun or the enemy's coming to take them over and, and, they're, and they're crying back to you, help, they're going to overrun us then you hear that and you come to their aid. If you have to fight through everything in the way, you come to their aid. That's exactly what the Lord Jesus does. This is what he's talking about. He's saying that you're in a battle. We fight the good fight of faith. You're in a battle right now. And your soul cries out to God, cries out to the Lord. What does he do? He sends his army. He sends the Holy Ghost. To you to help you through that battle, through that, that, that particular battle. He sends him because you cry out. 
He's swift to do that, to succor them that are tempted. Now, you think it's a sin to be tempted? No. You say, well, praise God, I'm not tempted anymore. We're going to bury you then, son. Amen. You're twice Amen. dead and plucked up by the roots and telling yourself a bunch of lies. Come down to earth and live with people. Sure, you're tempted. Temptation come all kinds of forms. That's a whole different message. But temptation, absolutely. So what do you do? You cry out to him. The Bible said when temptation, no man is, God does not tempt any man. He's tempted by his own lust and led away. Temptation comes. But you cry out to God and he'll give you a way of escape. And you got the way of escape, you're all right. You're okay. Look at the difference of the spiritual. Look how, look how, uh, you know, how closely related they are. It's kind of a foggy thing there, isn't it? You're tempted, but you reject the temptation, and so you're okay. Are you following me? We want to make everything black and white and cut and dried and put it down on a ledger and add everything up and it makes sense. The spirit world's not like that. It's not like that. You walk in faith. Walk with the Lord. God will bless you for it. And as you leave out of here today, remember that family up there in southeastern Pennsylvania. Good. My goodness. My goodness, goodness, goodness. Remember that family. Father, in thy name I pray. Thank you for your word, time we've had to come together today. Lord, I hope that I presented Christ the way you want me to present him. I hope I said what you wanted me to say. Lord, that's what I'm here for. That's what I live for. I'm the messenger. That's my job. I'm the messenger. I'm not the savior. I'm not the healer. I'm not the deliverer. I'm the messenger. And I pray that you'd use that now. In Jesus' sweet name I pray. Amen. Stand up here this morning.